I have watched a lot of games of TFT in my lifetime. And out of all of the games that I've watched, whether they were high roll, whether they were low roll, whether they were hilarious or very interesting decision making, in this VOD in particular, this one, I, I was dying of laughter watching this shit. It was just so funny because the decision making was so wonky. The end board was so interesting. But overall, just the end result was just a plot twist I was not expecting. So I hope you guys enjoy. And also, best of all, by the way, this is not some bronze silver game where we're watching low elo players make mistakes and laughing at them for being terrible at the game. No, this game was taken from some of the best of the best on the Japanese TFT ladder. Let's get on to today's video. So here we go. We are inside of Didi's game. Now, Didi, this is taken from the Japanese servers, and there are probably a bunch of things that are in Japanese that you probably don't understand, but I will try to translate wherever I can. But just to give you some translations off the bat, we do have the, I believe, the Unstable Rift, the Dreaming Pool, and the University for our three realms. And it looks like we are getting thrown into the Dreaming Pool, even though everybody else wanted to go to the University, whatever. Um, in terms of the lobby, because I know there are a bunch of player names in here that you probably do not recognize, because again, this is the Japanese server. This is a very high elo lobby. A very this is like some of the best of Japan that are in this lobby. Uh, just to give you an idea here, we have um, Midori who is rank two of Japan, Nukomaru who is rank nine of Japan, Didi the person that we're watching who is rank five Japan, and we also have Taro no TFT Daigaku who is rank four of Japan. So a lot of really strong players in this lobby. More than half the lobby is 900 LP and above. So this is a very very difficult lobby to be playing in. Um, we do, fortunately though, get a Rek'Sai pair out of the orb, so we're already looking at a very decent start here. Um, definitely opens up the lines for something like a Rek'Sai reroll board, where if you are unaware of the board, it is usually Rek'Sai 3, Lissandra 3, and you're playing around 4 Bruiser, 3 Freljord, and sometimes 3 Void. Here we're given the 2-1 Augments here, we're given AFK, Unified Resistances, and Army Building. Now, even though, statistically speaking, Army Building is better than Unified Resistance... Oh, sorry, Unified Resistance is statistically... Whoa! Slow down, Bucko. Unified Resistance has better stats on average than Army Building at 2 1. But this is one of those points where you don't want to be just looking at the stats, you gotta think critically about your position and the spot. If we take Army Building right off rip, we are given a Rex I 2 and it's a very, 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 not 100% guaranteed, but very highly guaranteed win streak from this position. So Army Building is definitely really great here. AFK is one of those augments I do want to talk about a little bit. It's not that great. It's only great uh, if you have a 2-1 build over start. It's actually incredibly OP if you have a 2-1 build over start because you get to basically open fort and you're basically open forting whenever you take this augment anyways because you aren't able to pick up any 1 cost, 2 cost, or maybe even vital 3 cost that you need during the first 3 rounds of the game. So you're playing down a lot of what could have been upgraded units. So you're basically open forting anyways when you take AFK. It's not a very great augment to take here. So definitely army building is the correct choice from the spot, which I believe we will see DD take in just a little bit. He does reroll just to make sure to see if there's anything better he could have taken here, but takes over, rolls Silver Spoon, takes Army Building, and then we're given a Vi. He doesn't tailor his board here, and I think during the commentary, uh, I believe you could actually hear him like kind of get confused. He's like, oh man, I have to get a Vi here no matter what. But the reality is that he could have actually tailored his board here for maybe something better. Although it's hard to say what could have exactly been better. He could have maybe teched the Renekton off of his board and then kept two out of three Void and then maybe spawned another Kassadin. Although it's hard to say if that would have really changed anything here from this spot, especially because he's not sitting on like a Kassadin pair of any means. But here we don't have any great item slams necessarily. We do have a potential Gunblade that is available to us. I would probably argue that making a Gunblade here is the correct decision, just because Rek'Sai really likes healing in general, and if we're going to commit to this Rek'Sai reroll line, Gunblade is really nice. It's one of the better items they can throw on him. Obviously, you do prefer stuff like Titans and BTs instead, but that doesn't mean that you can't still build a Gunblade on him. It's actually still a very strong item to still have on him, uh, especially if you're trying to tempo early, and then you can always pivot off the Rek'Sai in case you decide to go against it. Now here, as we can see, he actually does end up losing the streak here, which is pretty unfortunate, and he actually decides to go with an Archangel Slam instead, which is just not a great decision, in my opinion. Um, You could argue the thought process is that if you slam Archangels here, you open up a sword for your Rek'Sai, and then you can slam a much better item like BT onto the Rek'Sai here, or maybe even something like, I don't know, maybe IE, but... It's not great because Archangels is a really shit item. Um, the reason why it's so bad is the same reason why Ascension is really bad. It's because the fight is almost always over by 15 seconds in. 
So by the time you've garnered enough value out of this Archangel so that it starts popping out a lot of extra damage, most of the times, because the fight has already been decided within 15 seconds, you're not ramping up that much AP, so it's just not a lot of value to garner out of it. You're definitely much happier slamming stuff like JG or Rabadons, where you'll get much, val much more value much quicker, and you'll have that power during the more decisive portion of the fight being the beginning of it. So Archangels is definitely not a great slam, something I definitely do not agree with here. And he ends up picking up the Velkaz or the chain off of Carousel. So right now we are looking at Void here, and it looks like right now the game plan is to try and hope we hit this uh, Void Crest at a certain point in the game and just play Void for not only tempo, but just for some HP preservation. Archangels, you could also argue, is probably BIS Kaisa. That's just because... Um, the fights last a little bit longer with something like 8 Void, where it's going to take a really long time for the enemy to just melt down a Baron, but also on top of the fact that you just have a bunch of, a lot of extra HP on the board, so Archangels can actually be pretty good on Kai'Sa, especially after the Mana Nurse, where she's going to take a lot longer to cast, so she gets actually a bit more value out of the Archangel staff. Um, still not sure if I agree with it though, just because you could have also done Shoujin, and then you could have played Shoujin with Kai'Sa, that's literally her BIS, and if Kai'Sa is the angle we're looking at right now, or maybe even just Vertical Void in general, Shoujin is definitely a much better slam over this uh, Archangel. So this Archangel staff just already comical. Not a great decision, uh, in my honest opinion here. Uh, I will say though, like I said in the intro, this is a hilarious game of TFT. Hilarious. And it's hilarious for like a multitude of reasons. The The funniest reason being that like, he just makes a lot of decisions that are just just wonky. Absolutely wonky. And it's it's so funny from like an American perspective because he just plays so differently. And right now so far, nothing's that different. The Archangel Staff, kind of questionable, but besides that, nothing is really that different compared to how anybody else would have played, especially on the American service. So there's nothing that is like too surprising yet. But... As the game progresses, we'll see just like how ridiculous this game can get. Uh, we do get a cloak and a belt out of the orbs and double magnetic remover, which is kind of interesting here. We do get pop another Rek'Sai side out of the dreaming pool. Slam the B team makes a lot of sense. We're probably gonna look for something like a Titans and maybe even a guard breaker for the belt. Uh, okay, but he slams a Sunfire. Very interesting. Again, another slam that is not that popular within the North American servers. Not a lot of people value Sunfire because it's hard to get a lot of value out of it and you'd be much, much happier with something like a Morello instead because there's a bunch of really good units that can hold Morello, but you can also just tech in anti-heal very easily with something like a Heimerdinger. So Sunfire, not the best decision in my opinion as well here, but especially because we lost our streak here, there's no like necessary need to tempo right now with some sort of like, you know, suboptimal slam like Sunfire. So here we're given social distancing, bronze ticket, and the honor roll augment. I believe my hair is dry now, so I can put my glasses on my head. I feel very uncomfortable filming these things without my glasses on my head. I just took a shower, but that's why they were off. But anyways, uh, that, that feels so much better. Um, this is an interesting spot. This is an interesting spot. We've already taken army builder or army building of, of our 2-1 augment. So we really do want to try to find combat power in a situation like this. It is a great augment though, so it's not like we're garnering that much more combat power, but you know, ideally you want to balance your augments. You don't want like triple econ, for example, because that would be really bad. Or if you go triple combat, you better be high rolling and hitting your units because it can be difficult to find the units that you're looking for. Typically, the good balance that a lot of North American players have found is that you go one economy augment and two combat. That's sort of like the, the balance, the best of what you can get, right? Or maybe some utility like red buff or whatever, which is really, really nice as well. But out of this situation here, I probably would take social distancing just because again, combat power is really nice, but we do have the opportunity to maybe take something like silver ticket. Now, silver ticket is an interesting decision. Taking silver ticket basically means you've hard committed into this Rek'Sai reroll comp. And again, from this spot, it's not that bad. We're sitting on four Rek'Sai's, we're sitting on the duplicate that's coming up on the army building. We're like three Rek'Sai's off of a Rek'Sai three? Four. Four Rek'Sai's off, my bad, from a Rek'Sai 3. So Silver Tick is definitely a potential option in this spot, but we hit Indomitable Will. Oh my god. Indomitable Will is so underrated, especially in comps with a hyper carry, something like a Rek'Sai 3, a Lissandre 3, who really could use the CC immunity, especially because Rek'Sai has this really bad interaction where he will bite, and if it doesn't kill them, he kind of like just T-poses. And then during that T-pose, if he gets CC'd, he's CC'd for like 
a long time for whatever reason. He kind of, It's almost like he gets stun locked, which is really bad. But Indomitable Will, this is an augment that gets significantly better as the game progresses here. And it's not like we're going to probably lose a lot of HP throughout stage 3 here. So it's definitely something that we can take from the spot. Again, at 3-2, it's averaging, what, a 4.67? It, it does look a little worse in the stats. But again, we're playing around a Rek'Sai reroll comp. It's actually probably not that bad from this spot. Definitely something that I would take in this position, especially if we're trying to play into the Rek'Sai reroll. Now, again, Golden Ticket, it's nice, especially if you're committing into this Rek'Sai line, but it means that you're 100% committed to reroll, nothing else you can do about it. Red Buff is also an option as well, but we just slammed Sunfire, so it's definitely redundant, not something we want to take here. So it's probably Indomitable Will from this spot. But, like I said, funny game. This is a funny game full of funny decision making. And in this spot, he actually takes Golden Ticket instead, which is a very interesting decision here. And before I got rudely interrupted by... Before I got rudely interrupted by some sirens, um, Golden Ticket's interesting here. He's, he's basically saying, okay, me, Rek'Sai, no pivot, no scout, uh, and he's just gonna full send it. And so what is the plan from this bot? Notice again, he doesn't roll at all here at level 6. He doesn't want to spike his board at all, which is also a very interesting decision here. Because if it were me, I would be rolling like at least a 30. Look for like a Vel'Koz 2, a Malzahar 2. We're sitting on a couple pairs here. We're sitting on a very awkward 5 void board where, you know, we could have actually made a lot... We could have lost a lot less HP had we spiked our board a little bit here. Malzahar won, Vel'Koz won. This is sort of the problem with Void, where during the mid game, unless you have a Vel'Koz 2, Malzahar 2, or maybe even 4 Sork, it's really hard to sit on a board that won't like lose you infinite HP. Because Vel Vel'Koz 1, Malzahar 1 are some fake units, and especially with an Archangel Staff, it's some fake ass damage. So as we can see, he I think he took like a 4 unit loss that last turn. He's taking like another 4 unit loss here. He was at like, I believe like high 80s, low 90s in terms of HP. We're already down to 73. We're taking some really fat losses here, which is not great. You definitely want to be rolling at least a little bit on 3-2 to try to preserve a little bit of HP. But again, funny decision making. It is what it is. Um, decides to take the Vel'Koz here off Carousel. Great. Maybe he decides to duplicate for the Vel'Koz 2 here, just to, you know, garner a little bit of HP preservation. Wouldn't be a bad decision, and I actually think it's not that greedy, but again, if he's trying to play into the Rek'Sai reroll, it's not unheard of to just hold on to the duplicator here and just keep sitting on this board. I think right now, the idea is that he just wants to lose streak all of stage 3, which is kind of interesting. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with it, but I guess his idea is streak all of early game, lose streak all of mid game, and then win streak all of late game. But... It's a little difficult to just lose streak straight up out of stage 3. Again, this is a 5 unit loss here. We're taking fat fucking losses. Um, I would have really liked to see him to just like roll at least a little bit on 3-2 to just really stabilize the board. Because again, Archangels. Fake fuck. I can't even iterate how many times I have to say this. But Archangels is quite honestly a fake item. It is so bad. But, and again, we also, even though we are trying to play into potentially 6 Void. Or maybe even the Rek'Sai reroll board. For any of those of you who don't know, Rek'Sai reroll, you really want to be playing this board from a winning position, meaning that like you have a lot of HP because you're going to be bleeding out stage 4. Um, so the fact that he's loose streaking here, losing a lot of HP, he's down to 49 HP at the end of stage 3. He's lost like almost half his HP within the, the span of one stage, which is pretty bad. You might also notice he's holding onto a lot of Zeds here on the right-hand side here. I believe the reasoning is because there's a Zed reroll player, so he's actually trying to grief the Zed player while also trying to like maintain his economy because it doesn't hurt him to hold the Zeds here. There's no reason not to, right? So here we get a lot of AP items here. We're sitting on a blue buff as well as the rod here. We do find the Cho'Gath too, and then we get a Kai'Sa out of the Dreaming Pool, which is really, really nice here. And what do you know? We tech it in. It's a six void board, but again, notice... By the way, you know something? He's rolling over the failure units here, which is very interesting. He's really banking on trying to hit this Void Crest here on 4-2, because if he doesn't, he's really fucked. Again, the Void board, I'm just going to pause the video real quick. The Void board, for those of you who don't know, it looks like this. The Rek'Sai Rito board is Rek'Sai 3, Lissandra 3, Sejuani 2, 3, Freljord, and Rek'Sai just hard carries throughout this board. Once you hit a Rek'Sai 3, it stabilizes pretty hard. Um, there is sort of a new variation that's been going around recently where because you don't get to play Challenger with Kai'Sa and along with the Kai'Sa Nurse, you don't really want to be playing around Kai'Sa in this backline, especially because this Void Remora doesn't really do much for you. It's, a, it's like a mini knockup. So what ends up happening is that you end up playing something more like a Rise in the background instead or maybe like a different Invoker because in general, I mean, you have a Shen on your board already, but you could do like a Rise. You can also do something like, I don't know. There's like, it's, it's hard to say though. There's not much else that you can do, but there's this sort of like this weird like four Invoker variation that sort of occurs where you have a Rise and you have the Karma as well and you can actually reroll for Karma 
Karma 3 as well. Um, but this Karma unit is not very good either in general, so I don't really like this variation. I think in general, just itemizing these two and then just playing Kai'Sa as like a utility unit is sort of the way to go. Um, again, it's fine. You don't really itemize Kai'Sa here because she's not a great unit right now. Um, especially post thirst, but especially with no challenger, she's just kind of a dead unit. Um, but at least she's there for the Void Remora and a little bit of utility with the Morellos. Um, but again, this board is really weird. We're also sitting on a lot of AP items here. So we're sitting on like a blue buff slam most likely, along with maybe a second Archangel staff, which would be really, really awkward. Um, but here we end up just committing the blue buff here. Really great way to kill the tears. And I mean, hey, at least it's on a Vel'Koz and Vel'Koz really likes blue buff. So maybe it'll do something here. But again, with Vel'Koz, uh, like with Archangels, again, it's so bad because multicasters like to end the fights quickly. So seeing that he has this Archangel staff, it's so bad. So here at 4-2, we're given Prismatic Augments. We're given What the Forge, Gifts from the Fallen, and um, I believe it's called something Unleashed Arcana in English. Um, all of this is shit. Uh, it's just a reroll every single Augment and pray for the best. You do notice he is playing Poro now because this is 13.13c. Uh, we don't really care about playing around any sort of Legends in general because nothing is that great. So here... Um, you can't really hear the commentary, but he is praying for that Void Crown, misses, which is really unfortunate, and we're left with Leech, Hedge Fund, and Golden Egg. It is never Golden Egg from this spot. 49 HP, you are going to bleed out and die. Everyone's going to pick up some level of a combat or some strong prismatic. They're going to just spike their boards like crazy here, and you're just going to bleed out and die. If you take Golden Egg here, you are losing. Leech, I like Leech from this spot. I think Leech is great from this spot. You do have the BT already slammed. But it's not like your AP carry has any Omni Vamp, so it's not like it's bad. Plus, it gives you a reason to spread components because your components aren't very great at the moment. So I actually really like Leech from this spot. But, again, interesting decision making. Funny decision takes fucking... Oh, he takes Hedge Fund in this spot. Like, this guy took Hedge Fund in this spot. He takes Hedge Fund. So let's look at our augments real quick. We're playing Army Building Golden Ticket Hedge Fund. Army building golden ticket hedge fund. This means that we are playing reroll no matter what, but we are not. Again, he's rolling over the Lissandras here. So what is the angle he's looking for? Again, we can't get a Void Crest anymore. It's not possible. I don't know if you can hear the commentary, but he hit, he said Yabaikamo. Like this is gonna this is actually probably pretty bad, right? And I agree with him. This is a pretty shit position to be in. Six void is not a very competitive board to sit on. So what can we do from our spot to make our board more competitive? We have two options. We either pivot out or we hard commit. And right now, what board could we possibly pivot into that could give us this potential out? We have an Archangel's BT slammed with a blue buff. There's only one correct answer. Think about it. Think about from this position, what could you possibly play to win out? What what board is available to you? If you go, go through like your library of different like compositions and boards and think about it. Because when I was first watching this game, I was lost. I was like, what could you possibly play from this board to win out? Again, six void. Really, really shit vertical to be playing in because you always want eight or it's almost always a buff four. So what can we do? Is there a board that we can pivot into? We have Archangel Blue Buff, maybe the Lux that's in our shop. Maybe that's an option here. We can maybe pivot into a Zero Lux, but with no bows, it's very dicey. What do we do? Is there a unit that uses Blue Buff, Archangel, and BT? No, there's not. Just, you know, for your sake, there's not. So this position is hard. This is a hard spot to be in, but there is one out that is just somehow available to us that I feel like a lot of people, including myself, forgot while I was watching this VOD. And notice he's level 7, and he is rolling here. And he is rolling, looking for Talias, looking for Valkazes, skipping over the Lissandras. Again, not playing around this standard 3-cost board that most Americans would play around, which again, Rek'Sai 3, Lissandra 3. Instead, Didi has opted to play Reroll Void, which is an interesting interesting decision to make and not only is he playing reroll void and again it, it's interesting because normally you would play it with like something like stable unstable evolution which is a augment that you can take here which gives you a lot of hp based off how many three cost or startup void units you have but even without it he just decides to fucking full send it and commit to it so he's playing a very interesting version of the board where again no Lissandra, and he's actually not playing Lissandra, which is kind of smart here because there's actually an actual reroll player who also wants Lissandra 3, so he wasn't going to hit anyways. Or rather, it would have been very, very difficult. But here is that what he decides to do, is that he decides to instead 
play for this like Rek'Sai 3 Vel'Koz 3 board, which is so crazy to think about because this is not a board I don't think any American player would play. It's a very strange board because you're relying on your backline damage being Vel'Koz 3 with only two multicaster instead of four. And usually with multicaster reroll, you usually want something like, um, you want the Sona 3, you want the Teemo 3 or the Teemo 2 and like play around those instead. But instead he just keeps sending it down. He's one life at 11 HP, hits the Rek'Sai 3, one off Talia 330 gold, and he doesn't roll in this spot, which is so crazy to me. He's sitting on 30 gold, and he's one life, and he has, like, he's one off Talia 3, which is definitely, like, at to some degree has to be a spike that is useful, right? But he just says, nah, fuck it, I'm stable, and he just sits on this board, which is, like, fucking massive balls, dude. Like, I would not have done that. So now we're looking at a Vel'Koz 3, Rek'Sai 3, and actually Kassadin 3 board, which is very interesting. And he, it's actually quite efficient when you think about it because he's rolling for like a bunch of 2 costs and 3 costs where the odds are very, very high, 30% to 35%. You have a 65% chance to see a 2 cost or a 3 cost in your shop. Uh, also, a bunch of rerollers in this lobby. If you don't know yet, it, now you know because Rek'Sai reroll, or rather just rerolls in general, are very, very popular. Here! Oh my god, this decision is making it so weird to me. Okay, let's rewind the clip here. I oh my god, I, I made a mental note when watching this the first time to talk about this point. Here, we have 50 gold, he hits a Belveth, right? He has 50 gold, he hits a Belveth, and he has a Hymer on his board so that he can get that free reroll for a module. But, look at his XP bar. Look at his XP bar. It costs exactly 56 gold to roll, or 56 gold to level, right? 56. What is so interesting about the number 56? Or sorry, 46, 46 gold. 46 gold to roll, right? What is so interesting about 46 gold? Did it occur yet? 46 is not an interval of 4. It's an interval of 2. Meaning that if he wants to level here, he needs to he needs to send 48 gold. He needs to, it costs him 48 gold to level here to put in this extra unit, this extra Heimerdinger onto his board. And what does this fucking clown do? Instead of leveling here and then using his free reroll, he buys the shrink ray. 44 notices he can't level unless he sells his Belveth, which he would never. Because if he sells his Belveth, he's in a really, really tight spot where he needs his Belveth 2 to win out. Because eventually he's going to take off the items off of Rex with the magnetic removers to play around this Belveth 2, right? It's Dreaming Pool. He's bound to eventually hit that Belveth 2 if he survives. But what does he do? He buys the shrink module. Now he can't level up. And then he rolls again, knowing that he could level next turn if he just chills. Finds the Mechano Swarp. Can't use it, by the way, because he has a Sunfire Cape. There's no reason to buy it. And then look at what he does here. He buys Mechano, even though he has Sunfire Cape, because I think in his head he's thinking like, oh, like the best modules is double shrink plus Mechano. That's sort of been agreed upon. But he buys the double modules, and then he puts the Heimer on bench, and then he has the audacity that goes, hey, yeah, bye, come on, which means hey, this is problematic or this is dangerous. Like, <laughs> sir, please, just push level 8 in this spot. It's so greedy. He is so lucky in this spot. To just not, he played it so poorly this one round, doesn't get punished for it, and then he gets to go to level 8 here, finds the Talia, and is able to level here, which is super, super high roll, by the way. It's so lucky, but it's just, it's so comical how this played out, and it's so just absolutely ridiculously insane that he's actually kind of in a decent spot now with the Talia 3, Kassadin 3, Rek'Sai 3 with two items on three, and this Vel'Koz on his board. Um, Again, very, very odd position to be in, and he's actually, again, he's chilling. He's actually winning out. He is not going 8th, unlike what I thought he was definitely going this game, and I was like, you know what? He's not going 8th. Maybe he's just going like 7th or something. Here, he's rolling to find a decent third module, but then, like, this guy, it costs 6 gold to hit the module. He has 7 right now if he sells the Garen. He's not selling this fucking Garen, and then he donkey rolls down to 0 anyways, trying to find a decent module. Like, what are you doing, my guy? And then he's missing on the shrink rate that he wouldn't have been able to buy anyways, so you could argue maybe he's just donkey rolling, trying to also hit that Belveth, but his rolls are a little inefficient because he has this Heimer on his board. He's missing one slot to potentially hit this Belvet 2. That again, he would not be able to pick up. He needs 11 gold if he wants to pick up the Belvet 2 plus this uh, 
you know, extra Hyper mod. And now look at this board that he's playing into. He's playing into a six Sork Omega capped out board, Taric three. Lux, I believe that's actually Lux 1, so it's actually winnable from this spot, but he's playing into, I believe, a Lux 1 along with the RE 1, so it's not like this guy's actually hit his board just yet, but he's very, very close. He narrowly, narrowly makes a buy, and again, he has no Omni Vamp that he would have had for his Velkos had he taken Leech. Now look, there's a Belvet 2 on the carousel. There is a Belvet 2 on the carousel. How many of you would pick up Belveth in this spot? I'm going to take a drink of uh, coffee while you think on it. Mm, so good. All right, back to the question. How many of you would pick up Belvin in this spot? It's like a no-brainer, right? Everybody and their mother would pick up Belvin in this spot. This is easy rot. That's okay. A little more frontline for your, for your Belkaz, right? Not the worst thing in the world. It gives you Belvin too. Really, really nice. What does Reedy do? He hovers over the Belveth, thinks about it. He took RFC. This son of a bitch took RFC in this spot. Which is such a strange decision because you are not like. RFC Velk or RFC Rexai is like not even that much stronger, but you're gonna throw it onto the Rexai here because you can just uh, throw the items off of him anyways, right? Or her anyways, right? But his idea is this: his idea is that we are playing in the Ionian Dreaming Pool, and because we're playing in Ionian Dreaming Pool, we are guaranteed a Belveth at six one. So his his theory is: I think I am strong enough to win out the lobby. Or rather, win the next two rounds. So I am not going to bother. We're going to hit Belvet 2 and we are cruising to 6-1. No problem. No stress. It will happen. He's saying this while still donkey rolling for this Belvet 2. Like, I understand if you think you're going to make it to 6-1, that's fine. But at least live by the statement. Like... Surely you just save up a little bit of the extra econ and then do the roll down, right? If you're that confident that you're gonna win. But he's like incredibly ambivalent. Unsure if he's actually gonna win out here. Again, barely scrapes by it, but is able to get through. This Talia is actually putting in a lot of fucking work. A lot of that CC, a lot of the knockups is really helping him stay online here. And he actually makes it to 5-7. Takes all the items off the wreck side here and then throws them onto the Bell Vet. Little a little early in my opinion. I get you can wait until after the anvil, see what you hit, and then throw the items on. Because you know, maybe you hit an item here that would have been really nice here. And sure enough, you hit the GA here, which I think a lot of American players look at that, they're like, oh, that's BIS Belbeth. And you can actually do something like RFC G A P T on this Belbeth, and that would actually be totally fine. Um Thing is though, if you do have RC, RC GA actually has some weird like anti synergy because the idea is that Belveth should be already pretty safe with RC. You don't actually need the GA, but um, it's nice to have. Um, I'm looking into the stats real quick of Belveth, and sure enough, you never see RC and GA together. So, oh, you actually do, but that's only if you have Ironia Spat um, Belveth. So, uh, other than that, you don't really want RC and GA together. It's actually worse. Then having just one or the other and then plus the RFC. So here he makes a very interesting decision here. Do not take the GA here in this spot, uh, which is, I guess, really smart in this decision. I personally, in this spot, probably would have taken GA because I don't play Belveth too often. But instead, he ends up taking the Rabadons here for the Talia. That's a decision. Now, he ends up itemizing Talia over his Rek'Sai because he thinks that Talia is going to do more work. And quite honestly, I think he's correct. Donkey rolls here trying to find this Heimer 2 and eventually finds it, which is nice. Doesn't get upgraded onto his board though, unfortunately. But it seems like it is okay. He's already secured his top 4. And not only that, it looks like he's secured a top 3 with this board. An absolutely wild game of TFT. It's just, it's so hilarious how this game worked out. He's sitting on unitemized Rek'Sai 3 that pushed him tempo to be able to eventually make the 6-1 to guarantee the Belvet 2. And it's just like, this style of play is just so interesting. It's so weird, but it works. And, in, and when you really sit down and think about it, it does make sense. Here, again, barely narrowly makes it by wins, and he's still win streaking, which is insane. He has absolutely nothing else to roll for, so the only thing that he can really do here is try to save up, maybe go 9, but that's probably going to be impossible because there's at least, I believe, 
three rounds maximum left of this lobby and even with three rounds maximum including the neutrals round he would only be up to about 60 70 gold it would not maybe 70 gold he may be able to go nine here it's really hard to tell but if he manages to preserve his streak it's definitely like maybe possible but here as we can see he ends up winning again and he actually makes it into the top two spot which is crazy guard breaker is the only natural real item to take from this spot because you want to guard breaker your talia you've already put one item on her might as well put on two and you are praying to god our opponent is playing a 9-5 supremacy with velvet two scion two kasante rise two inside of ionia ari two heimer two like <laughs> this is a stacked fucking board this is my goodness and you're telling me that this board, his, like, his board is able to top two in this lobby? That is fucking insane. And notice the positioning of his Velkos here, by the way. A lot of Americans would actually put Velkos in C1 or C7 to try to angle it so that it would hit the backline carry. But he actually prefers middle here because his idea is that the Velkos will shoot straight forward and then the two blobs will go side to side, hitting everything and you're making use of all three blobs. Obviously, he does not win here. That would be a fucking crime. And he goes out with a second against the 9-5 Supremacist. But still, nonetheless, a very, very interesting game. And nonetheless, it was... Dude, this game, like, I was dying of laughter. I just thought it was so ridiculous. But anyways, thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys learned something. Take care and happy climbing.